the, the talk is about early reflections, and particularly the the, the uh, now now now. Oh be yes, closer I, to I this. forget. Yeah. I have to go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, wide the uh, um, I, I, um, there's this perception I call presence. I've been trying to figure out a good name for it. I'm cur currently using the word presence. But what it really is trying to say is that there's a property of sound that lets people know that I'm talking to them. OK? And it's, it's psychologically wired in your brain so that when your brain hears this property of sound, you, you tend to pay attention. It's actually rather hard to, to ignore. It sounds the seven color of kind of thing. <laughs> no, it's not at all. Um, uh, it has nothing to do with frequency response, which I'll demonstrate. But just to, just to show you what I mean, I'll turn around like this. And you'll probably notice that the, the, the sound changed enormously. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just timbre. There's something about it which says, that person's far away. And I can equalize it so the timbre's the same and it's still far away. Okay. So I'm going to talk about that. That's what, that's what this talk is about. Um, what is this presence and why does it, why does it matter? <laughs> Sounds are all around us and, and we need to know which ones we have to pay immediate attention to and which ones we can ignore. And some sounds, like gunshots, are loud and inherently threatening. But other kinds of sounds, like me talking, you know in milliseconds, probably 50, 50 to 100 milliseconds, whether I'm close to you or far, far away. Okay? And the question, and, and as I said, you can equalize for timbre, and you can, you can make loudness so it's always <coughs> constant. And people still know, and they know immediately. OK, um, it might, it, <laughs> evolution has driven this, clearly. Um, a sound that's close to you demands attention. And uh, your brain somehow latches onto that and tells you about it real quick. Um, and that has survival value. So evolution has found a way to do that. The question is, how did it do that? What does it mean to us as audio engineers or hi-fi listeners or concert goers? OK, so um, that's what this uh, talk is going to be about. Um, so let's just move on. It must be of fundamental importance because, as I say, there's hardware to do this, and it's really quick. <coughs> now, recording engineers know all about presence. In fact, they use that word. Um, and the reason is, is very clear. Um, I'm my experience is as a classical engineer, but I know that um, at a high level, I haven't worked at this level as a recording engineer, but I have friends that do. Um, you, you do a session with, say, the New York Philharmonic, and uh, they give you something like half an hour to get your balances while they're sort of warming up. You have to do that. And then it's time to go, boys, take one. And after take one, Meta or whoever it is is conducting runs into the control room and says, let me hear it. And he says, I can't hear the second oh, but fix it. OK? He wants presence. <laughs> he wants to be able to localize every in instrument and hear what they're playing and know which instrument screwed up, if any, and know which instrument the recording engineer hasn't captured. And they can hear it. That's the recording that the engineer has to make. If they don't make that recording, they need another engineer. OK? So, um, they know instantly when a microphone's too far away. They can hear it right away. And they say, well, we'll just move that a, a couple feet forward, and everything is fine. Why? What is that? Why does that work? And why is it such a small movement can often make an enormous change? Okay. The same thing happens in halls. I've just recently, well, the last five or six years, learned about this aspect of it, where I've, I've turned it into a, something I do, just do. You have something like a string quartet playing. It could be a rehearsal or whatever. And you walk up to the string quartet and you hear bing, bing, you know, violin, violin, cello, viola, OK, and you're sitting there. You can hear every note. And you're a recording engineer, so you can do that, right? And then you walk back. You keep walking back. And suddenly, and it happens over maybe three feet, the sound goes from bing, 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 bing to shh, like that. And it suddenly is far away sounding. And you can't tell which instrument plays which note unless you know the score, which you might. Or you open your eyes, and then you can see who's blowing this way or that way, and then you say, ah, that's how it works. So if you have your eyes open, this is very hard to hear. But if you shut your eyes and you just use your ears only, there's a very distinct point where everything turns into a fuzzy ball. And my point is that when it's a fuzzy ball, you can take a nap. A lot of people might like that scene. 
okay? Because they've, they've had a busy day, a lot of arguments, whatever. They go down, sit in row Q, or I mean, no, not Q, row, no, um, say, XX. Uh, XX. <laughs> in Boston, that'd be a fine one. <laughs> and they take a nap, okay? So there's something to be said for that, but not much. Well, the subject's too vast, vast for a talk like this. Um, and so rather than go through a whole lot of theory, at least at first, I want to start by telling some stories, because stories are sometimes easier to remember the point of than a lot of theory. So let's tell some stories. Um, well, OK, a lot of people know me as a recording engineer. That's fine, an inventor. And I'm trying to remake myself as an acquisition, for whatever that's worth. Um, but um, as, as you probably understand, making a successful reverb algorithm takes a lot of learning, actually. You have to think about it a lot, because you have to try and figure out how to ma manipulate reflection patterns, basically, sound patterns, in such a way as it causes a certain perception. So I've been working on that for a long time and trying to understand the physics of that. Why does a certain kind of reflection cause a certain kind of perception? And unfortunately, the understanding of room acoustics based on that knowledge was quite elusive. I worked with uh, Neil Muncy, and one of Neil Muncy's favorite phrases was that acoustics is like an onion. You peel off one layer, and there's just another layer underneath. Um, another thing that happened, a bit, um, this is another story, it's not on the slides. Um, uh, well, here I made, a, I made a thing on the slide here, which really is important. When I invented the Lara system for acoustic enhancement, uh, Steve Barber and I started installing this all over the world. And in fact, the first system we put in was with Neil Muncy in Toronto at a theater called the, the Winter Garden. And, um, and, and so I put this thing in, and, and it, was, it worked very well, actually. It, we had two microphones, and they weren't particularly close to the orchestra pit or the stage, but they didn't feed back. You, you didn't hear feedback. You didn't hear coloration due to feedback, which was the idea. And it caused an increase in reverberation. This was a vaudeville theater, very dry, full of fabric. It gave a kind of nice warmth to the sound. People were very happy about that. And so we felt that was great. And uh, John Bradley got interested in it. Now, John Bradley, as you probably know, was in the National Research Council of Canada. He's very well known as somebody who measures concert halls. He sort of developed a lot of the techniques for doing that. There is something called the Concert Hall Research Group, started by Bradley and Baranek. It's still running with uh, Tony uh, Hoover running it, I think, um, uh, trying to collect data on concert halls. Anyway, John got all interested. Oh, he got to come and measure it. So he came to the Winter Garden, and he <coughs> set up his equipment, and he measured it. And although the measurements showed some differences between when the system was on and off, the current acoustical measures said it should sound worse. And at that point, I realized that there was something really important that we didn't know about acoustics, because, um, uh, because it just wasn't working. And um, I have to say that the measurements that John Bradley was using at that time are the ones everyone is still using. OK, so that I'm going to talk about a little bit. OK, the, 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 uh, the story then uh, moves to Berlin, uh, where Albert Krieger, who was a tonemeister at, at the uh, Staatshof of Berlin, um, uh, and I installed a rather primitive layer system in the Staatsoper. Uh, it was primitive because they didn't give us any money. And uh, Krieger said, why don't you come over and help me with this? And I said, OK, came over. And uh, we set up this thing using a whole bunch of old East German equipment, um, which mostly worked. And uh, uh, we got it working. And Krieger and I adjusted it. Oh, this sounds great. And I sang from the stage. It sounded wonderful. So uh, eventually, Baron Mann comes in and uh, starts conducting a rehearsal of, of Rheingold. This was, incidentally, the reason that the Lairs was there is Baron Mann had just been installed as the music director in the Staatsoper, which was now in West Germany instead of East Germany, as you probably know. And, it became Germany. Huh? It became Germany. It became Germany, right. right. Anyway, um, and uh, he wanted to do the ring. And he managed to wheedle enough money out of the City Council of Berlin to do the, at least Weingold and Walke. and But he started conducting there. He said, I can't do this. It, it's too dry. It's, it's like 
it's just like conducting outdoors. Can't do it. Um, do something. And Krieger said, well, there's this guy greasing it. So um, Brown Boeing says, whatever, get it in. And so we did it. All right. Well, anyway, we turn it on. I got it adjusted, everything. Baron Boeing starts conducting. He says, mm, that's kind of nice. Um, and he jumps out of the pit and starts walking around. And he stops. Stop! He says, I hate it. I'll give you 20 minutes to fix it or turn it off. He hears what? He, he, he doesn't like the sound. Yeah. Well, this is in German, so I don't remember what exactly. He hasses it. It's not möglich. Aus. Unmöglich. 20 Minuten. Aus. Anyway, uh, so uh, I thought very hard at 20 minutes. <laughs> and the studio where all the equipment was up six flights of stairs. <laughs> At least you had an escape rope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I said, okay. I, I had an inspiration. The inspiration was he's complaining. I, well, the first thing I said is, Mr. Barenboim, tell me what you don't like. He said, I can't hear the singers. So I said, singers, 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 vocal formants. Okay. I, I took the main equalizers and cut cut them with a nice gentle slope centering at 500 hertz down 6 dB. So 1,000 hertz was 6 dB under 300 hertz. In the reverberation level, not the reverberation time. This is reverberation strength, OK? Brown Bunsen, perfect, he said, never change it. <laughs> and it's run like that for 25 years. Now they tore the building down. And that's a whole other story. OK. Um, so uh, anyway, from that, I learned. I learned that for Barenboim, at least, the most important aspect of opera sound is not the orchestra. It's whether you can hear the words. Now, you can read Wagner's book on opera. Mm. And he says the same thing. Okay. And if you go to Bayreuth, yes. um, it's actually true. Now, why is it true? It's in part because Wagner put a cover over the orchestra, so the singer has some chance of singing over them. But also, the Bayreuth is a very special acoustic. I do not have time to talk about it. You can talk to me about Bayreuth later, because I learned about it. I've never been there, but I learned a lot about it. OK. Excuse me, was that a, a shelf or what kind of filter was? Uh, the, just a shelving filter, yeah, an electronic shelving filter. Shelf I don't stop okay. it. I mean, you have this parametric equalizer. No, it's a graphic equalizer, East German. So you go up and go, okay? And, and you had to do it in two of them because we needed stereo, of course. All right. So I, did, I installed a, a, a system in Amsterdam at the Musique Theater, which is the main uh, opera theater in, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, Peter Lockwood, who's the, I believe, still the assistant conductor there. And I think Hainchen might actually be still music director, but I'm not really up on it. Um, uh, and uh, one of the nice things about the layer systems, you have a remote control. So you can walk around the place that you're working with, listening to a rehearsal, or, or, or you can even sit in a live concert with the remote control, um, listening very carefully to small changes that you can make. And that's great. Well, I said, well, with Peter Lockwood, um, hmm, this is really nice. Wonder what happens if I raise the reverb level half a dB. Ooh, I did. And Lockwood said, no, 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 no. He said, look, Siegfried, this was Siegfried now, is sitting in the, in the, in the singing to us uh, from midstage. He said, Siegfried just moved from in front of you to about 10 meters behind. And I said, shut my eyes. He's right. If with your eyes open, you can't see that. But he's right. And at that time, Heinrich Hainchen, who's conducting in the pit, goes like this to me. I come up, he says, put it back. <laughs> Half a dB. Half a dB. Half a dB. The difference between close and far is binary. It happens all at once. You either sense it or you can't. And a half a dB difference in re reflective level makes a difference. It can make that difference. Another system in the Royal Theater in Copenhagen. Uh, we did a sort of standard layers install, the same we've been doing in Amsterdam and, and, and Berlin. And they loved it. It used 128 Genelec 1029s. Okay. All around the rings. 
all around the rings and in the ceiling. Okay, but the, there, like all operas, there's a problem between the balance between the singers and the orchestra. And the reason is opera orchestras keep getting bigger and bigger, and the singers don't. Well, some of them do. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, these days, uh, operas are moving toward spelter people. The, the, that is out. But anyway, that's another story. I found out, huh? Because there's no fat lady. That's true. <laughs> Never ends. Okay. Are they Fleming? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, uh, um, anyway uh, I found out while I'm in Amsterdam looking into asking somebody about their finances that, that a singer that can sing 3 dB louder than another singer gets paid twice as much. What? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You get paid proportional to the amount of power you can put out as an opera singer. <laughs> so Copenhagen was not using the top rank of singers. Okay? They needed a help. So see, see the proscenium edges here. That You're looking from the stage out into the hall. There's a very nice little proscenium edge right here and here. And I managed to mount these uh, microfect gefil uh, beam forming microphones right there, just at the height of, of a singer. And, and crossed the beams right across the front of the stage. And then I routed that with proper delay through the 128 speakers around the audience. And then with the, with the, the remote in hand, and Michal Schoenemann, the music director, in, at my side, he's very friendly. What a joy to work with this man. Anyway, um, we walked around, sm smooching up the level up and down. And we found that more than a 2B dB increase in the loudness of the singers, I was measuring that, okay, was unacceptable. Unacceptable. 1.5 dB was, was beautiful, okay? So we set it there. <coughs> and after Carmen, the first production with that, the stage manager just said, oh, it's so wonderful. He couldn't get off of me. David, yes. question, when you say 2 dB increase in the loudness of the singers, was this was this a first arrival sound, or was this no, a total energy. total energy. Oh, total energy. Yes, okay. right. I, I, I was sitting there. I recorded these things. We went back, looked at the recording system on Six and Off. You can look at the, the strength of the singer. Uh -huh. And there were places where the orchestra didn't play. And, um, and it was louder. When you, when you moved it up, it was louder. The total energy, it was louder. It sounded louder. Okay. But it still had presence. Okay, but a little bit too much, and it lost it, and they didn't want it. But that 1.5 dB, that was worth a lot of money. <laughs> okay, all right. Then they said, well, you do a good job there. Why don't you work on this Copenhagen new stage, which was a shoebox they wanted to use as a drama theater, and they were having trouble hearing the, uh, the actors, because if you can see the shoebox, shoebox not good for drums in general. It kind of reverberates, but we had 64 genlex in there. But you can look in here, you can see there's no proscenium arch. There's no good place to put these microphones. Now at this moment, I do not remember where we ended up putting them, something like here, okay? But we put the beam forming microphones. I said, this is not going to work. It's too far away from the singers. The microphones are gonna be putting up too much reverberation. Amplifying that is just gonna make it sound worse. But I said, okay, well, maybe we can do something about that. Um, I said, okay, I built a little circuit that turned the microphones on any time there was a beginning of a syllable. And it turned it off about 100 milliseconds later. Believe it or not, that worked. As long as you didn't push it too hard. It worked. And uh, it made the singers louder, uh, the actors more the actors, louder. Yeah. The actors were louder and they were more intelligible. You could understand the words better. So we had five drama directors listen to Chekhov system turning on every 10 minutes. Uh, live, full audience, live, uh, live show. Result was unanimous, it works, we don't like it, please turn it off. <laughs> why? I said, nobody leaves the room until they can tell me why they don't like it. Well, that took another 15 minutes. Where they hemmed and hawed and they said, finally, it's because the actors sound further away when you turn the system on. We would rather they were not, we would rather they were unintelligible than sounding further away. Because if they're not sounding further away, the audience will listen ever more carefully. And that's just what we want. Did you ever try sound field mics? I own two, three. 
Um, okay. No, I mean, they're not. Idea, in this iteration, <coughs> they're, so they're nowhere close to the feels. Okay. The sound field. It's first order pressure gradient. It's it's just it's ordinary mic basically in the patterns. These gefils are very different. They have something like 10 dB more directivity. And, and that's just barely enough. Can you spell gefils? Gefil. Uh, G-E-F-E-I-L, I think. OK, that's a brand. It's yes. brand. Yeah, okay. it's East German brand. It's East German brand. But it's a German brand, right? D-I-L-I-L, sorry. OK. You're in Denmark. Names may speak. All right. Clarity presidents and sort presence and source separation occur through pitch extraction. OK, this is talking about the Copenhagen thing, which Alvin just said. But um, the other thing I want to say here is moving directors know all about this. It, they insist on dry acoustics and highly directional horn loudspeakers for dialogue. And in my experience, the Met HD experience is more engaging and dramatically effective than being live at the Met in most, set, in most seats. Why? Because it's so engaging. The sound is wicked cool, OK? And you might like the video, too, but that's not the point. <laughs> here's, here's Pickman Hall at Blanche School. It's Pickman, not Pickberg, or whatever it is in the, in the, in the announcement. Yeah. Pickerman. Pink -up, oh, well, anyway. Um, I, just, um, I, I think you wrote Pink Up at this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so anyway, anyway. I think um, it was Pickering. Pickering, Pickering. that's right. Pickering. Anyway, um, we got the chance there, and it was a wonderful uh, chance to do a bunch of experiments in this hall because I've recorded there a lot, and particularly in the early days when I was just a student or working as a recording engineer primarily, and I hated it. It's very difficult to record in this stage. It's full of echoes. Yeah. Stage was highly reflective. And that echo muddiness comes right out to the audience. So in the audience, you hear all that glop on the stage a lot. And the question is, what could you do about it? Well, we did a whole lot of experiments. This is Jonas Sachs from uh, Ascentech playing the cello. He's actually pretty good. Uh, and, uh, and found that, that what we learned is that adding absorptive panels around the back and side walls made enormous improvement. Actually, we expected that to be the case, although Ascentech did not. They said, you need a shell. So we said, well, we made a shell out of upturned tables. And it definitely made it worse. We learned that when presence is lacking, it's the earliest reflections that are the most responsible. Absorb them or direct them away from the audience. That's a very important thing to learn. And as I say, adding a shell made it worse because it made the, early, the reflections come earlier and stronger. The conventional fix did not work. The wisdom predicted putting a more small shell would improve it. Strong early reflections were supposed to help, but they don't. What kind of repertory was that? Oh, all kinds of things. <laughs> I played music. It wasn't just speakers. speech. It was singing. The, the, it was music. We had pianists. We had people playing. I even brought in a portative organ. Ed Jones played for us. There was a sign-up sheet, and any any person who wanted to sign up to play could play. I have to thank Harriet. She was absolutely essential in this job. Well, it's a people management thing. You don't want and to. That's not my. That's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> The final design was dictated by these experiments. This is a picture. And again, this is a very fine job of, of making something that seems to fit with the hall, I think. But these, these are, you know, they're four by eight, uh, two inch fiberglass. And they're very effective. The, the stage is now, the, the, it doesn't have this enormous flutter echo problem. The sound in the hall is clear. It used um, to be an interesting hall. You sat in the audience and you felt that you sit in front of two speaker system. <laughs> well, the sound came from the frauds. Well, anyway, critical lessons we learned. One, presence depends on the ability of the ear and brain to detect the direct sound as separate from the reflections that soon overwhelm it. That's the big lesson, right? So, and, and the first time I started measuring the direct, mentioning the direct sounds at the International Con Conference for Acoustics, people said, what is the direct sound? We've mm -hmm. never heard of that. Why? <laughs> I'm serious. Presence, the clear perception of close distance and sharp localization, is of utmost importance in drama and in much music. Presence is per perceived through sound onsets and at frequencies above five five hertz, 500 hertz. Actually, 1,000 hertz is a better guess, but 
I'm, I'm saying 500 just to be safe. The perception of a presence is all or nothing. A very small increase in strength can switch a sound from close to distance. Now, this is interesting. I don't know if a blind person can do better than a sighted person. But with my brain that has a lot of visual stuff going on, I cannot. I make a lot of binaural recordings at concert halls. And if I have in, in my mind the image of what was in front of me when I made the recording, they sound absolutely perfect. If I put them on without calling up that image, the orchestra's right in front of me. It doesn't matter how far away. Even in Boston Symphony, I have wonderful recording from uh, the front of the first balcony, 110 feet in the back. It sounds, the orchestra's right in front of you. It's gorgeous, but it's right in front of you. That's because it's all or nothing. The other thing is you can do that trick in Boston Symphony. The orchestra's playing away, and you walk up to them, and you walk back through the aisle with the eyes closed. Okay. The only thing that changes is the or orchestra gets narrower as you walk back. The, the sound of the hall is pretty much the same. It, gets, it doesn't even seem to get all that much softer. The loudness goes down a little bit, but the image is changing. That's about it. Now, I can explain that, but maybe not, not in this talk. When reverberation time is not excessive, it's the earliest reflections, which are the strongest and closest to the direct sound, which are the most damaging. And then how is it possible that we can do any of this? Well, let's, let's go back up a little bit. What are reflections and why do they, uh, they matter? For our purposes, reflections are delayed copies of information mixed back into an information stream. What is information? What's an information stream? Well, information just collect them bits. Turing said any information can be represented as a set of bits. That, that's a very important uh, piece of philosophical knowledge, I suppose. And uh, an information stream is just information that is moving from one place to another. It's bits per second. OK, what is the purpose of sound? Well, sound, from an evolutionary fan, fan standpoint, is all about information. The creature wants to know what's out there. Okay? And you know, the more the information they get, the less they're likely to be eaten. And evolution is really cruel. That's something you learn pretty early. Um, that's why we have such incredibly complex systems. Well, we're, you know, people are, you know, and crickets, they're all, if you look at life, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, but it's all about the fact that it's as complicated as it has to be, otherwise it gets eaten. <laughs> In almost any information channel, reflections are a form of noise. You, anybody who, who works with digital circuitry knows all about reflections. And God help you with reflections in a, in a cable, you know, anything. Any information stream is corrupted by reflection. Too many reflections will disturb the ability of any creature to detect vital information. Well, I'm not going to go through coding. You all know about coding. You have to code things to get information. But the interesting thing about this coding here is what is speech? How is speech encoded? to go through the channel. The channel is, from, is air, you know, but it's noisy. It's full of environmental sounds, of other people talking, whatever. Okay, and you need a coding mechanism that gets through that. Well, humans divide the sound spectrum into 30 one third octave bands, approximately, with a detectable signal of noise in each channel of about 20 dB. That has to do with the nerve firing rate. You only have a certain amount of, of hair cells, and they only fire at a certain rate. You have a certain number of channels. It comes out to be about 20 dB. Okay. Um, uh, but, and you know that the number of bits per second in any channel is proportional to channel bandwidth. So 1,000 hertz band can carry 10 times as much information as a 100 hertz band, obviously. So high frequency bands are more useful than low frequency bands. Speech information is encoded in the relative amplitude of formant bands above 800 hertz. Right? We all know that? I think you all know that. So a vowel is a certain combination of, of resonances. And those bands will be high, and other bands will be low. A different vowel will have some bands, other bands high, and other bands low. And you know what vowel it is by the relative amplitude of these formant bands. But notice that the formant bands are, at a minimum, third octave wide, okay? because that's the resolution of the, of the ear system, of the basal membrane. Now, that's controversial. But um, there's good reason for thinking it is, in fact, third octave. 
With human speech, however, the energy in each format band is not random. <coughs> it consists of numerous high order harmonics of a fundamental pitch. That's obvious. People have known that for years. Why? Why do we speak with a high order harmonics of low frequency tones? Why? Well, let me just back up. This, I'm just going to point out here the sensitivity of the ear is not accidental. It's heavily weighted to frequency of the vocal formants. This is the transfer curve from outside the head to the oval window, through the bones in the middle ear and the pinion. Notice that there's this huge peak at 3 kilohertz. There's a reason for that. Why? Because that's where all the information is. It's also true that most uh, noise, environmental noise, has a spectrum like this. So you really want to cut that off. And another reason is speech has a spectrum like this. Because the fundamentals are much stronger than the upper harmonics. This curve compensates for all of that. It's not accidental. What's the significance of pitch? Why do we, most animals, communicate with sounds out of pitches? Another question is, why can humans tune musical instruments to the accuracy of greater than 1%? Even I can do that. I don't consider myself a musician, really. OK. Why? Why don't we just play bongo drums? Why do we play violins? Why can we separately understand two simultaneous talkers if their fundamental pictures, pitches are different by half a semitone or more? Why are we better than Siri at understanding speech and noise by at least 10 decibels? The last time I looked, it was 20. I'm being safe. Because the ability to separate sounds from each other and from noise is so evolutionarily important that we've evolved a special neurology for performing it. And I happen to be a lone crier in the dark about this right now. It's very hard when I give a talk to this to lots of people, uh, particularly people who've been studying hearing all their lives. I get a lot of pushback. That, that thing does not exist. We, we know it doesn't exist. We've been looking for such things. We've never found it. I said, well, what signals have you been using to look for it? We've been using tones and clicks, and sometimes noise. You'll never find it. Well, some people thought the cost of evolution doesn't exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Mika, for that great insight. Okay. Well, humans lived in caves where reflections and reverberance are significant barriers to communication. But the mechanisms used to overcome this are likely far older, I think, common to all mammals, certainly, and cert probably to birds, too. Speech and, and most music, as you know, is probably front, you know, probably know is front loaded. You, you found, find the sound of most phones very quickly at the beginning of it. And the voice may trail off for a while. You may get a little bit more information from that, but mostly front loaded, yes. I heard the speech was only like 60 or 70,000 years old. That could be. So did all this happen in that short time? No, I don't think so. As I say, I think all of this is really very old. And there aren't that many caves. People had to live in tents or something. Well, OK. I, so this is stupid. I, I won't go there. I, well, I mean, it's clear to me that speech and hearing and talking evolved concurrently. And I would, as I said, I think the hearing mechanisms common to this are so important that they're everywhere. The question is if we didn't develop the speech to, comp to, co to complement our hearing. See, that's the that wouldn't happen. No, I mean, no for example, you, you if, you listen to different, if you listen to different languages, yes. hearing, they use different parts of the spectrum. I mean, not talk, I mean, the best example here is the Latinos of South America who speak half, half an octave pushed up at least, if not a full octave. We're talking about the fundamentals, yes. not the formants. The formants are remarkably constant. Okay, and and even even children, they have these high squeaky voices, but the formants are almost where an adult would put them. Formants. Formants. Formant. A formant is is if you look at a vowel, there's a certain pattern of frequency. These, if you have a sonogram, you can see these really clearly. You go a e i o u. There's these bands that go different for each one. There's two major formant bands, and and the combination of their frequencies and their amplitudes determines most vowels. Okay. Now, English is quite different from Swedish. This is something I learned a long time ago. That the formant patterns of Swedish are exactly in the gaps between the formant 
patterns for English vowels, which is why it's so damn hard to talk Swedish, so nobody can hear your accent, because the, the way they make vowels is completely different. All right, it's front-loaded. Um, but, now here's the question. What if there are many talkers all using the same form advance? They're using the same form advance. I say they're constant. Everybody uses the same ones. Okay, and, and, and the resolution of the ear is only a third of an octave, okay? So the form advance of one speaker have to overlie the form advance of another speaker. And we should not be able to separate them, but we can. So here's a summary. Reflections reduce the amount of information that can be detected. Speech consists of short bursts of sound. Speech is information above 1,000 hertz. Information of these frequencies is carried by the amplitudes of closely spaced harmonics from low frequency tones. Pitch, which is circular in octaves, and I didn't say that, but that's really important, is vital to human communication and acoustics. It's vital for both accurate localization and for source separation to detect the direct, it is vital to detect the direct sound as separate from reflections that follow it if you're going to have accurate localization and source separation. These facts seem obvious, but they're not Question. commonly dealt with. Yes. Why is pitch circular in octaves? I, I will try to talk about that. But it's important, clear for understanding the neurology with which we detect right. it. The point is that we detect pitch to very high accuracy. The basal membrane has an accuracy of third octave. Mm -hmm. If you had a mechanism that was circular in octaves, that would give you a way of knowing the frequency of everything, okay? But your sense of pitch being located in the mechanism that's circular in octaves would be perceived as circular in octaves, and it is. And that's property of any comb filter, which is what I'm proposing. Okay. <coughs> Presence is lost two ways. Sabine started the study of acoustic properties that affect speech intelligibility, and he found the primary mechanism, at least that he was dealing with, was the masking of syllable onsets by reverberation. In other words, you're talking, reverberation builds up in the room pretty soon, you can't hear what the person is saying because the reverberation is louder. That's true, but acoustic science has kind of stayed in that rut. We're trying to learn, or we're, I hope we're learning, that presence, the perception of closeness to a sound source, is possibly equally important. Intelligibility, which is what's guided acoustic science forever, does not measure communication. Communication requires both attention and memory. It doesn't matter if you can hear words if you can't remember them 20 minutes later. In other words, you've got to hear words, you've got to parse them, you've got to put them into sentences, you've got to use grammar or whatever you need to do that, you've got to extract finely meaning, and you've got to then put that in memory somehow for enough time that it can go in long-term memory. This all takes something called working memory in the brain. People study this. Neurologists have a lot of knowledge about working memory. Among other things, they know that working memory in children is smaller than it is in adults. So if you speak rapidly to a child or the acoustics are bad, they're not going to remember the way an adult would because they've run out of working memory before it's been possible to store it. That's very important for classrooms, and I don't think people know it. So I've developed a measure LOC for ability to localize sound. I'm not going to talk about it. There's really not time, but I'll sketch. I'll show it like right quick. An another factor in the obsession with the beneficial effects of early reflections is laboratory tests of single reflections, which have dominated acoustic science. So you start with Haas and a lot of other people talking about the audibility of reflections. That's all here. Um, this is uh, Michael Barron's spatial impression diagram. The important thing about both of these is basically, well, a little bit less here, but notice that <coughs> Notice that the zero is here. The maximum level that he was testing was about plus five relative to the direct sound. Okay, a single reflection, five dB louder than the direct sound. Well, what happens in a hall? You go into Boston Symphony, almost any seat you pick is what? The, the critical distance is 20, 20 feet. Okay, so if you're at 60 feet, it's down more than 10 dB. 
Okay, so the reflected energy in halls is typically much higher than the direct sound energy. And these diagrams simply don't apply. First of all, they're single reflections. Second of all, they have the wrong axes. And they have a, a, another inherent danger. They all make the assumption that data from a single experiment, uh, reflection experiment would actually apply to a hall. And I'm trying to make the point that it doesn't. Tool, Floyd, he, I like to include, I worked with him for years. <laughs> um, he, in his book, makes the explicit assumption that if a single reflection is below a threshold of audibility, this is the threshold of audibility, then you can ignore it. It doesn't count because it's not audible. That's just plain silly. <laughs> what, what if there are a thousand reflections below that threshold? You still can't hear them? You never have a single reflection. This is a, uh, an impulse response from the Longy Pickman Hall. Uh, this is the direct sound. This is your <laughs> reflections. This is 100 milliseconds right here. Okay, And by about here, this is noise. You can't possibly distinguish a single reflection in that. And this is an impulse response, which means it's white frequency response. It means that what you're seeing here <coughs> is almost entirely above 10 kilohertz. But you can't see the reflections. It's just too many. But you can, you can, you can integrate them. So if, if I go back to that impulse response, and I say, well, I'm going I'm to send a note through that by convolving it. This is the direct sound, OK? It has a certain level. And then reflections will cause the level to build up as the note is held. <coughs> OK, so here's the direct sound pressure from that note. And here's the reflections building up as, as energy and the reflections get added to the note, OK? And you can see that up here it goes to about 0, <coughs> which means that right here at about, what, 23 milliseconds, the reflected energy is equal to the direct sound. And then it gets you know, a dB higher, OK? Now, my measure LOC is simply the ratio of the area under the blue line to the area under the red line inside the box. And you can see the area of this is just a little bit higher than the area of that. And so the, the direct sound, the LOC value is minus 1, which is not good. But this was an omnidirectional source. And most instruments and voices are not omnidirectional. So if you add that in, it's not too bad. How about in a hi-fi listening room? <laughs> well, Ted Schultz, thank God for Ted Schultz. I wish I knew him, but he died before I really was cognizant of him. Anyway, uh, he measured a whole lot of listening rooms in the Boston area. And he found that, in general, the chosen listening position was very close to the critical distance, which means in most listening rooms, you're about here on this curve. And you can see that, very quickly, the, the total energy, if a note is held in such a room, goes up very fast. And your only chance of hearing the direct sound happens in this first 10 milliseconds. So it's not very likely. But if you have a directional speaker, if you have quads or a large horn or magnet planers or whatever, um, then this room would have very good imaging. Okay. But for omnidirectional speakers like Bose's, um, forget it. Convenient untruths. Early loud reflections add spatial impression, creating a more beautiful sound. That's an untruth. Early reflect, it's, well, it's, it is actually true if they're not too many. You have to keep them below the level where the direct sound is still detectable. And then they do, in fact, make a more beautiful sound. That's no question about it. Early reflections from the front and overhead add loudness to the sound without disturbing the direct sound, I didn't put in here, if they come before 50 milliseconds. That's a very common untruth. For sound reinforcement relies on this assumption that properly delayed frontal and overhead speakers can beneficially amplify almost any event. And they get a lot of money out of that. But is louder really better? And make sure, do we be doing that at all? OK, here I'm going to finally get around to playing some audio. All current measures say that this, this sound, I'm, I'm taking the speech here, that this is the speech. And I'm going to send it through this impulse response, which happens to be all pass. So it doesn't change the frequency response or the amplitude at all. Okay. 
Um, and I'll, I'll just play this. Actually, I'm going to play it again. This one, it, it plays through two loudspeakers, and that's not optimal, as, as maybe you'll see. Should I put it on mono? or? No, that would make it worse. <laughs> well, it is mono. So that's not a problem. <coughs> Present, very clear. Uh -huh. However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1,000 hertz, the sound is very different. It might be perceived as distant or muddy. Let me start that from the beginning. It seemed to have already been going. So the first part of this is unscrambled. If I record my voice with a microphone close to my mouth, the sound is very close to the ear of the listener. Present, very clear. However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1,000 hertz, the sound is very different. It might be perceived as distant or muddy. OK, that, that all current acoustical measures says, say that both sounds are identical, and that, that that's basically perfect sound. Okay, And I'm, I'm trying to say that that's just not true. And the sound has no presence because the, this IR randomizes the phases above harmonic, harmonics above 1,000 hertz. Uh, I can demonstrate that, actually. Um, uh, I have a model, which I tried to model um, the inner ear. And this consists of a lot of um, standard things that everybody knows, followed by a set of comb filters. And if you can get the comb filters to track a voice, then you can separate them. So you track one voice, track another one with comb filters, and you can separate them. So here, here is dry monotone spe uh, speech. I am speaking in a monotone at a pitch of C below middle C. OK. And uh, I add to this a second voice, my own voice, same timbre, but a semitone higher. I am speaking in a monotone at a pitch of C below it is middle C. Although it may sound a bit odd, it is easy to understand every word that's clear. Now, OK. Uh, now the question is, can you actually pull them apart with comb filters? And the answer is, I'm not very good about it. And this example is three years old. I'm probably a little bit better at that. I don't have it. Well, no, that's enough of that. Let's try this one. So anyway. The point is that you can sort of do it, and this is a hard problem, actually. First you have to separate, then you have to resynthesize it, and I'm not good at either of them, really. And I haven't had a million years of evolution to do it. That's important. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just skip all these, but I, I'll, I'll go to here. Um, I'm going to try and explain what's going on here. Um, this is the syllable one, and this is syllable two. I've just recorded with a microphone, and these are the waveforms. And you notice right away that this is very special. It's, it's not a waveform. It's, it's a buzz song. Mm. OK. Right? And, and this is one, wah, wah, wah. You can hear that. <laughs> it's got little pulses in it. And two, two, a little bit less, but still there. All right. And if you pass it through that impulse response I showed you, you get this. All right. Well, what about that? So let's play it. Oh. This, this, is, this is the same thing I played before, but it's just the left channel. Well, I'm going to play just this a little bit first. If I record my voice with a microphone close to my mouth. OK, now I'm going to play this one. This is just one speaker. One, two, three. Oh. One, two, three. Oh, it's a different thing. Sorry, not the right demonstration. Ah, sorry, I screwed it up. I wanted to play this through just one speaker. Replaying something with two speakers in a room like this is always worse for presence than just one. And it's a wonderful demonstration to make. You'll have to take my word for it. I, I can just turn the balance control over. Oh, yes, we can do that. Well, that's the little one. The little, the little one. one. Uh, little, little one on the left, right. This one? Yes. All right, great. Let's, let's, uh, let's do the left speaker. Um, and then I'll do both. OK, that's great. Thank you. Perfect. Oh. What am I doing here? There we go. Just lost. Present. Very clear. Uh, However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1,000 hertz, the sound is very different. It might anyway. be perceived as distant or muddy. Let's start over the clear part. If I record my voice with a microphone close to my mouth, the sound is very close to the ear of the listener. Present, very clear. However, if I scramble the harmonics above 1,000 hertz, the sound is very different. Got it? That's what happens when you use sound reinforcement. The difference is palpable. 
Okay, here's, here's another one. These, these are kind of fun. This is, this is showing that you can actually get noise out of this. So that's um, a, a little bit of a PBS NewsHour covered with noise. Uh, it's, the noise is what you call red noise, okay? So it's 60 dB per octave boost on the bass. It matches speech pretty well. All right, and this is what happens if you send it through the model. It sounds like this. Not perfect, but interesting. Um, this one is um, the same speech, but with reverberation. It's the United States, because that actually is recorded from the balcony of Sanders Theater <laughs> with, full, with full audience. Well, actually, it was, there was no audience, but I made an impulse response, and then I exponentially changed it to 1.4 seconds, which would match the full audience. With no audience, it's 2.4 seconds in there. That's another story. Maybe I'll get to it. It's a disaster. And this is what happens if you if you send it through the model. This is one of the really frustrating things in the United States. Okay, well anyway, I'm just trying to show that these FIRs actually do something. Now, this is the signal that goes that, that this comes out of the sum of uh, critical bands from 1,000 hertz to 200 to 2,500 hertz in the model, and you can see that they're incredibly spiky. All right, so. Summing bands in this way with the fil filters that I use um, results in an enormous number of really sharp spikes. And that's important. Um, and this is what happens if we, if we send it through the, 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 uh, the, the phase randomizing filter. It looks completely different. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can hear it. OK, this is, this, this, the sound is one, two, three. It, it, it does, the first three is this, and the second three is that. The first three you'll find has pitch you can actually hear what it's saying. And the second one sounds like a whisper. Okay, I'm saying that that's why you can hear something that's close or far away. Because when you get these little spikes, the ear knows. This, this has pitch, and this sounds like a whisper, and it knows. Oh, this is the model we don't have to go into this. That's the FIR that you're using, that I'm using. This shows the frequency resolution of it. This is a, a, a major triad, 200, 250, 300 hertz. And you can see these are 200, 250, 300 hertz. And then if, if I do it, uh, if, I, if I lower the, uh, if I do it if with the, uh, with the, the, the uh, well, if I use these patterns. It's the fifth that's lowered by an octave, so it's 200, 250, and 150. It's exactly the same pattern, except now there's a big speak at 150, which is why inversions of triads sound basically the same. That's because they affect comb filters in this way. OK, summary of the model. We have separated signals from a number of sources into separate neural streams, each containing the modulations received from that source. These modulations can be carried across bands to detect timbre. IAD and ILD can be found for each source independently once they've been separated. That's the power of these FIRs.